Hey, Spooky Sooner here. Uh, it's been a year since I've started doing YouTube uh, over that course of time. I think I put out uh, 30 scary story videos, uh, a bunch of AI art, music videos, and then some shorts. So I have 220 subscribers, and I'm very proud of that. Uh, I didn't go for trying to pay for them or anything like that. I just wanted real, real followers, so or real subscribers, so I appreciate everybody, and uh, I'm going to continue to do this, um, and I hope you continue to listen. So, the stories that you're about to hear are from last year for Christmas. Uh, one of them was very popular. My uh, coming home from deployment story uh, had been, for some reason, uh, my most popular for a while. So, since I've been doing this for a year, I have learned some new uh, techniques and and am able to speak a little bit better when I'm doing these videos. So you can definitely tell a difference in when I first started to where I'm at now. So hey, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And if you like my stories and you want to see more on it, you want to see scripts, uh, pictures, things like that, uh, lots of spooky material, um, go to my Patreon at uh, Spooky Sooner. Patreon.com slash spooky sooner. But still, uh, enjoy the stories and stay spooky. It was Christmas time and everyone was in the mood for holiday cheer. April and Ethan were two kids obsessed with Santa Claus. Their dream is to catch Santa Claus in the act of delivering presents. They wanted to see if he was really real or not. Their friends at school had been telling them that Santa wasn't real, but they didn't want to hear that. They came up with a plan to catch Santa in the act. They were going to see the big man in action. So they went on eBay and found a book on booby traps and improvised anti-personnel devices, like in the movie Nightmare on Elm Street. Obviously, they didn't want to hurt the big guy, but maybe they could just make non-lethal traps to catch him. Now that they had a plan to catch Santa Claus, they needed to save about $500 in six months mowing lawns, taking out neighbors' trash, and walking dogs. Adults are always really nice and willing to help kids make money. They would use that money to purchase the materials they would need to set up traps. When November came, they went shopping and got wires, nets, bolts, and other materials to build booby traps. They were getting so excited because December was coming and they would be able to finally hatch their plan. In mid-December, their mother found a bag and asked what it was, and they simply responded, that's stuff for our class. We are building something for our science class. And their mother said, oh, that's great. What are you building? And they said, we're trying to figure that out, but it's going to be amazing. You'll see. So finally, December 24th comes, and their mother has to work late. She tells the kids to behave, and the neighbor will be checking in on them frequently to make sure everything's okay. This is the perfect opportunity because it allows April and Ethan to build their defenses that night and finally catch Santa Claus. The night had finally come. They got their supplies all together. They placed trip wires about three feet from doors. They put trip wires about three feet from the doors and sticky paper that was clear on the windows and within tripping distance of the wires. They put a net on the floor right in front of the Christmas tree that was linked to a pulley attached to the roof that they screwed in with their father's old drill they decided not to put a fire in the fireplace so Santa didn't come down the chimney and burn up. They didn't want to kill him. So they created notes and placed them on the door, telling him to come in. As the clock struck 11 o'clock, they heard a large commotion downstairs. Very excited, they thought, it must be Santa Claus. So they get their slippers on and they run downstairs. And in the net, there was a man dressed as Santa Claus. Oh my gosh, this must be him. They were so excited. He tripped over the tripwire, got sticky paper in his face, and was caught by the net that was anchored to a stud in the ceiling. 
The hook was rated at 10,000 pounds. That was a little overkill, but it was clearly working now as Santa was hanging, contained in the net. However, upon further inspection, they noticed that Santa was really dirty and grimy and smelled horrible. It was a combination of body odor, cigarettes, and alcohol. He was yelling crazy stuff and cursing. He sees April and Ethan and tells them, Let me out, or I'm going to kill you. April and Ethan notice that he has a weapon of some kind. That's terrifying. When they looked more closely, they noticed that it was an axe in his hand. What kind of Santa has an axe while he's delivering presents? He does have a red bag, though, and the kids say, Santa? He says, I'm not Santa, and I'm going to kill you when I get out of this netting. Realizing this was not Santa at all, April calls the police. Within minutes, the police come and cut the man out of the net. April also calls their mom. Their mother comes home to all the police cars outside of our house. She runs straight to us and cries uncontrollably. It turns out the man was a deranged killer on the loose after he escaped prison and had killed two families on the block already that night, making our house his third stop. In his red bag wasn't presents. Instead, it was duct tape, chloroform, rope, and handcuffs. The police told us we were very lucky we had created traps that particular night. Although dangerous, it saved our lives. We were able to catch the killer before he killed us and waited for our mother to come home from work. Our mother held us tight and was shocked but was impressed we had created a maze of traps so well that it defended our house. When she asked us why we had done it, we told her that we were trying to catch Santa to see if he was real or not. She cried and held us tight. If you ever actually see Santa in your house, approach him carefully. It's probably not the real Santa. Everybody loves the elf on the shelf. The idea is simple. The elf is a guardian for the presence and is watching the children. It will secretly report any suspicious child activity around the presence to the parents. If anybody is trying to tamper with the gifts, the elf will alert the parents. It's a very funny concept, but it keeps the kids from messing with their presence. But has anybody ever seen an elf that has a mind of its own? So it's Thanksgiving, and the family decided to put the elf up while decorating for Christmas. They got the elf out of its box like normal and noticed that the elf was covered in grass and dirt. That was odd because it had not been outside or anything. It had been in the box for an entire year. So I asked my wife and two boys if they had messed with the elf throughout the whole year, and they said no. This is the first time we've seen it since last year. So I clean it off and put it up on the shelf. Over time, I noticed that things are missing around the house. Not totally missing, but just relocated. Keys would be in different places, knives would be on the floor, things would be out of my junk drawer, things like that. One time I found my keys under a tree outside. It was originally in my junk drawer, but it wasn't there. So when I found them, I went to my boys and asked them, Hey, did you guys put my keys outside? Were you messing with them or getting in the car? And they said, no, we're not sure. You must have dropped them when you were coming in the house. One day my son comes to me and tells me he got cut by the elf on the shelf. I disregarded it as a child's imagination and assumed that he was cut by a broken ornament I found under the tree one night when I was sleeping. How could an elf do something like that, I thought. It's just a doll. It's not like it can move or grab anything. One night when I was sleeping, I heard the door open. I assumed it was my wife, so I didn't do anything drastic. But I was still in about like half of a sleep state. But I opened my eyes when I felt a presence in front of me. It was the elf standing over me with a knife. 
I grabbed it and I threw that elf against the wall. When I threw it, it opened the back of the elf, and a bunch of components started spilling out of it. A bunch of robotic components. I picked up the elf and looked at it and noticed the back had been sewn up. So I opened the rest of the back that wasn't broken, and I find extra components, and I was surprised to see that there were linkages going to the arms and legs that seemed to make the whole thing move via remote control. I also found a camera in the place of a missing button that was on its chest, like the elf had been retrofitted to be controlled. But why would somebody retrofit this elf on the shelf to have a camera and linkages to arms and legs? We called the police. When they arrive, they spotted someone in our bushes. They put the spotlight on the individual and drew their weapons. It was a man. It turns out that when we had purchased the house and it was in foreclosure, the previous owner was bitter about us getting the house at such a great deal. There was a man, about 46 years old, that lost his job at a local tech company. His company specialized in creating technology for robots. He had used his skills to create an elf on the shelf that he could control remotely to kill. However, he could not get the elf to effectively grab the knives very well, and it kept dropping them at random times, so he couldn't go through with the murder spree of the new house occupants. That's why the knives were in odd places. So why was the man there that night? Well, he was there to finish the job the elf couldn't do. He was there to kill all of us. The man was arrested and is in jail for premeditated attempted murder. Do you know where you live? Do you know the history of your address? Do you really know if your household items are safe? Be careful who you accept gifts from. Happy holidays, everyone. Be safe out there. So it's the holiday season, and I'm finally going on a trip back home to see my family. I have been on a long deployment, and finally, after a year, I'm getting back home. This is the first time I have been able to go back home and see my family. Hell, this is the first time that I have touched dry land in a long time. We had a quarantine deployment and did not get to go anywhere this time. It was the worst. The plane lands. I get my rental car checked out and grab my bags. I find the rental car by hitting the lock button multiple times and load it up with my bags. I think that's how most people find their cars. Anyway, I strap in and start heading to my family's house. I am driving for about 20 minutes and notice there is a really thick fog layer in the town on the way to my house. That's weird because it usually isn't foggy like this this time of year. Honestly, I'm not sure about seeing fog like that ever. Have I been gone so long I can't remember? I suddenly get a migraine when I'm thinking about it. I carefully try to stay on the road as the migraine subsides. As I am driving to my parents' house, the fog seems to be getting thicker and harder to see through. It is becoming very difficult to see the road in front of me, so I have to use my fog lights and reduce my speed considerably. I need to make it there in one piece. I am going about 15 miles per hour now. It would be unfortunate to go through an entire deployment and die on the way home. Trust me, it does happen. I had a friend that was hit by a car two days after another deployment. He was just walking down the street from a fast food joint back to his apartment when he was struck by a vehicle from behind. It was a hit and run. The poor guy was in a coma and had to be in intensive care for months. 
Ultimately, he survived the ordeal. While heading down the foggy road, I am starting to notice that there are no other cars on the road but mine. I know it's late, but I remember seeing at least a few cars on this road at this time back when I lived here. The road is eerily devoid of any human presence. Despite all odds, I get to my parents' house safely, but no one seems to be home. All of the lights are off, and there are no cars in the driveway. It is eerily quiet. I had just talked to my mother on the phone when I left my duty station, and now they're nowhere to be found. It looks like my parents' place is abandoned. I knock on the door. There is no answer. I tried to call them from the front door where I'm standing, and there's no answer. It's like they're not home at all. Where could they be? I called my mother and finally get a hold of her, and she says, Hello, sweetie. Yeah, we're all in the house. Just come in. That's extremely odd, since all the lights are out and nobody seems to be home. I open the door and go in the house. The door is unlocked and opens easily when I open it. The atmosphere completely changes. It goes from dark to light. Suddenly, all my family is there in the main room of the house. Everyone is there. My mom, my dad, my brother Mike, my sister Katie, even my uncle Bob and Aunt Martha. My grandma Patty and my grandpa Walter were there too. I haven't seen them in forever. What a great welcome home. They are all dressed up for Christmas wearing festive sweaters. The tree is beautifully decorated and there's a hot meal cooking in the kitchen. There's a glorious fire in the fireplace. What a perfect Christmas family get together to walk into after all that time deployed. There was only one thing that was really confusing me. I know I had been gone a long time and I had missed a bunch of family stuff but I thought that my grandpa Walter had died while I was on deployment. Now he's here, standing in front of me, like nothing has happened. It stays in the back of my mind as I get around to everyone and talk about what I have been through. I talk to everybody and thank them for being there, and everybody welcomes me with open arms. They all raise their glass and give me a cheers, and Walter says, We're so proud of the sacrifice you've made for your country. Everyone is always saying, thank you for your sacrifice, but when he said it, he had a sad look on his face. We are glad you were able to spend your last Christmas with us before you go on the next step of your journey. The next step of my journey? What was that? My mom cries while hugging me and says, I'm so sorry that we lost you on your deployment. Lost me? I'm right here. What do you mean? Sweetie. I don't know how to break this to you, but you fell off your ship and you drowned in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and you are dead. What? A jet blew you off the side and you fell 90 feet. You were dead on impact, more than likely due to the water becoming like concrete at that height. They sent out the helicopters to look for you for six days straight, 24 hours a day, but couldn't find you. This is Limbo. You are on your way to heaven or hell. Hopefully it's heaven. And this is your last chance to see your family, which is why your grandpa Walter is here. You were right. He died in his sleep about six months ago. Isn't it great you can talk to him one last time? We want you to know that we love you and miss you, and just because you're dead doesn't mean it's the end of you. Merry Christmas, everyone. Make sure you love everyone as much as possible. You never know when you're going to go. And if you do, will you know you're gone?